Fillet of fish from a dish, share box and evening frocks, Big Mac down a cul-de-sac and even under a drying rack, medium fries in rainy skies, or maybe cheeseburgers in the bath. How daft. Wraps through cat flaps, nugs on rugs, or perhaps a chicken sandwich to the river. Because yes, we deliver. Download Uber Eats or Just Eat and enjoy McDonald's at home. At participating McDonald's and locations only. See mcdonalds.co.uk slash mcdelivery to see if there's one near you. See Uber Eats or Just Eat app for full details. Delivery fee applies. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. Secrets don't come with price tags. People do. Lock your doors. Close the blinds. Change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by author Timothy Phillips. We discuss his book, The Secret Twenties, which takes a look at espionage in 1920s Britain. There is a link to Timothy's book in the notes of your podcast app. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please consider supporting it by becoming a Patreon subscriber. You'll get early access to episodes and transcripts. Also, if you're a fan of spy films, please do check out my spy film, The Dry Cleaner, which is available on Amazon and iTunes. Just type in The Dry Cleaner Film and you should find it. If you don't put the word film in, you might find something else. I've included a link to the trailer in the show notes below. We also have some podcast merchandise, so you can now walk around with secrets and spies, cups, coasters, t-shirts and tote bags, which is really handy if you're trying to save plastic on your weekly shop. Please check out the link to our Redbubble store in the notes below. Without further ado, let's get started. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Timothy, welcome to the podcast. Hi there. For the benefit of listeners unfamiliar with you and your work, can you just please tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I grew up in Northern Ireland and uh, weirdly, but not for any suspicious reasons, ended up um, learning Russian throughout my teens. (laughs) I went to the only school in Northern Ireland where they offered Russian. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I know. And um, uh, kind of, um, they tricked you into thinking it was an easy thing to learn because we, I think we seem to sp- spend the first three years learning the alphabet and all the words that are the same as English words. But then obviously um, the heat gets turned up and, and I, I turned out to have an affinity for it and, and really enjoyed it. So I, I kind of followed on with Russian and history at university and did a doctorate in the end. Um, not intelligence focused at all, a a history of 19th century Russian holiday resorts. Um, uh, And then um, by degrees, I've always been interested in intelligence um, personally. And um, after I wrote my first book, which was about the Beslan school siege, I kind of decided to go with something um, a little bit lighter, though, Mm. as we'll probably come on to, there are always dark um, corners in intelligence history um, and um, took myself off to Kew to the National Archives and, and spent many, many happy Saturdays playing in the declassified MI5 files. And, and that's where I eventually kind of hit upon the, the subject matter that's become the secret 20s. Yeah, fantastic. Well, your book, I love it. The Secret Trend is fantastic. And it's sort of about um, British intelligence during the 1920s, a time that was known as the Roaring Twenties. And um, so as you mentioned, you were at Kew doing the research. Can you just tell us a bit more about that? What drew you to this subject and about how you go about researching a book like this? Because I'm assuming you must have been going through lots of files. I guess uh, I I did genuinely kind of, uh, when I was thinking of different things I might write a second book about, I I genuinely took myself off to Kew and I'd read somewhere that MI5 was declassifying things and I guess in my mind if I cast back I I think I probably was thinking oh I'll go and look up about the Cambridge spies and the 50s and the 60s and um, then I kind of discovered that actually the, the, the most complete record for any decade is um is for the 20s um uh th- that apart from possibly the second world war and, and i just got drawn in uh, to be honest what drew me in first of all were two things um 
some of the personal letters that MI5 intercepted, um, often needlessly in the wrong. And it's kind of surprising that they did, but it's really surprising that those have survived in the files because they kind of show up what a dragnet um, intelligence gathering is. And, and, you know, the turns of phrase, the kind of harking back to a completely different lifestyle, um, you could see in there um, the way that society was becoming freer and in some ways modern, but at the same time, you know, a time before Britain was dominated by American culture. So there were um, ways of talking to one another mm. activities that, that seem quite alien. Yeah. And then the other, the other, um, the other thing, which basically the same point, but um, the wonderful transcripts that MI5 made and, and the GPO made on behalf of MI5 of personal telephone conversations that were intercepted. And again, that just, you know, so filmic, so visual as you read the conversations. Uh, and I, I got carried away and, 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 waded through thousands of thousands of um documents i could imagine i could imagine crikey <laughs> how did you keep track of it all because there's really there's so much breadth of information i mean i honestly wouldn't know how to begin to write a book like this but i suppose the more you read the more you get a feeling for things i'm assuming yeah it was a problem i'll be honest with you that that became one of the um challenges of writing the book and it took mm. me longer than i expected mm. and i kind of figured out in the process of doing it that there are advantages to working with a body of material that mm. is all printed and where all of the people you want to talk about are dead because uh, it's kind of all settled fact and nothing's going to change. But there are huge disadvantages as well because um, in my first book and in the project I'm working on now, I've been able to interview real people. You can go back to them. Mm. You can check things with them. Mm. Um, and also you kind of get a sense automatically from them of what they think is interesting and important. Documents don't necessarily tell you that. I kept track of it all um, with a camera. So um, on the laptop that I'm talking to you through now, um, I have 10 to 15,000 images of um, MI5's 1920s archives. And so I, <laughs> I, I would read stuff when I was there, but because I write part time, mm. I also needed to take stuff away and be able to read it um, at home or, or at my leisure. So um, that that's kind of physically how I kept track of it. But um, in my brain, there was a lot of... Um, mist and tangled threads mm. well let's hope you don't invent time travel because otherwise the russian intelligence services might give you a lot of money for what you have in your laptop yeah or just just take it um and um i'd be found somewhere um with some some sudden symptoms that um, <laughs> didn't relate to any previous illness i'd heard yes. <laughs> so um one one of the great things about your book is, is is a great history of british intelligence and so looking at the sort of mechanisms at that time can you talk to us about how british and sort of came to formalise and structure its intelligence efforts because it kind of happened in that decade. That's absolutely right. I mean, it won't surprise your listeners, I think, to learn that Britain kind of uh, felt its way iteratively or perhaps to be more uh, more um, vernacular about it, stumbled towards having a coherent intelligence system starting back in the sort of 1870s, 1880s. Um, first of all, because of the threat from Irish uh, terrorism, Irish nationalism, uh, forming up a secret part of the uh, Metropolitan Police called uh, Special Branch. Um, and um, then at the turn of the century, partly through the encouragement of Lord Curzon, who comes on to be an important figure in the 1920s uh, battles with the Soviet Union, um, uh, you get the creation of... Uh, what becomes known as MI5 and, and MI6. Um, only in the First World War uh, do you get uh, what becomes GCHQ, the Government Code and Cipher School. And at the end of the war, there is serious consideration given, uh, not just to pairing back the wartime size of these organisations, but to abolishing them altogether, because um, Britain was diving headlong into a bout of austerity. Um, 1919, 1920, there was a sense that um, all of this kind of uh, all of this growth of the state could be chopped back, uh, and really it was um, it, it, it was partly luck, partly um, the efforts of a few people in the cabinet um, who kind of lobbied on behalf of the intelligence agencies that the organisations survive into peacetime and develop. Uh, mechanism, develop areas of, of um, activity that don't overlap too much 
um, th there is always in intelligence um, history and today mm. that issue of overlap and um, uh, scope creep and and kind of internecine squabbles between organisations, and that was very much the case in in the nineteen twenties. Nonetheless, I think day to day, MI five knew what it was doing, MI six as well. Mm. Um, and um, they were the kind of two activist wings of the intelligence agencies, heavily reliant for manpower on special branch because they weren't very big organizations. And then being consumers of what the government code and cipher school produced. Yeah. And 1919 was an eventful year of a lot of political unrest through the British Empire. In your book, you uh, point to the Secret Service Committee report that was sort of dated February of 1919. And that kind of sets the tone for British intelligence efforts for the 1920s. Can you talk to us a little bit about that time and that Secret Service report? One of the things I love in, in that report, um, which clearly didn't happen, um, uh, but was given serious consideration was um, the idea that even in peacetime, the British government might actively engage in counter propaganda mm. among the populace. So they might actively have sought um, to um, get their message across without kind of tying it back to themselves. And, and what was the message they would have wanted to get across? Basically, it was don't support um, socialism uh, with a capital S, um, uh, which would include the Soviet Union, um, but it would also have included um, probably for many people the Labour Party. Mm. And so um, that document kind of sets out a very full, um, uh, what's the word, a very wide ranging potential role. And, and then that doesn't get taken forward. But what was playing on the minds of the people reading it was that... Um, Britain itself had escaped um, any kind of major revolutionary um, upturn. There had been some mutinies mm. um, uh, of uh, troops who didn't uh, want to continue serving and wanted to get back to their ordinary lives now the war was over. But across the empire, particularly in India, um, but also in some newly conquered um, parts of the empire, like uh, what we now call Iraq, um, uh, there was real fear that that there would be something revolutionary happening, and that the Reds, the the Russians, would somehow be um, influencing that either ideologically or or indeed by supporting with manpower. It was really what I think really comes across through that document and a number of others around the time is, you know, people could only look into the rest of the world beyond Britain as if through a glass darkly. They could see that a lot of very frightening stuff was happening, um, but they were really dependent on eyewitness accounts of diplomats or officers who were returning from particular areas. Um, and and they really, you know, they didn't know where this was going to go. And, and of course, we know from the other side that there was great hope in in um, Soviet circles that uh, the whole capitalist system, the imperialist capitalist system, would collapse and crumble because of, you know, events in Hungary, um, events in Bavaria, um, and that didn't happen. Um, but um, that's not to say that they weren't, uh, they didn't have some reason for believing that it might. Mm. What I think is really significant about 1919 is that that is what people remember when they are invited later in the 20s to consider that the Soviet threat might not be quite so great as uh, they're saying. And so they think back and they think, well, it's only a few years ago that they murdered the Tsar, they took over the largest country in the world, and they managed to f ferment these revolutions successfully, even though they didn't kind of stay in power for long in, in a whole variety of places across the world. Mm -hmm. So intelligence chiefs were deeply concerned about Bolshevik Russia's growing power and influence internationally. And in the spring of 1920, the then Prime Minister David Lloyd George invited the Russian government to send representatives to, to London for peace and trade talks. Can you talk to us a little bit about this and how it had an effect on the intelligence efforts at the time? Yeah, you know, um, I wouldn't have said this when I wrote the book, which is a couple of years ago now that I finished it. Um, but it's a really good analogy, I think, to begin with. If you think today about how um, the government today is allowing Huawei, to um, fit 5G, um, and it kind of feels like doesn't have much choice about that, the people who support that, because Huawei produces equipment that no one else does. Mm. Um, and yet, people who would ordinarily be supportive of the government, um, and indeed 
some of them belong to the same party as the government, are saying this is a huge threat. What, what are you doing? You're playing with the safety of the country. It was really very similar in 1920. Lloyd George, Prime Minister, what he sees is that the European economy, the British economy, cannot recover unless Russia is selling its raw materials into the system. And Britain in particular um, needs a number of those raw materials for some of its core industries. The one that always sticks in my mind, because I didn't kind of ever think about how these objects were produced before is pig bristles. So the British brush making industry was dependent on pig bristles sent from Russia. Yeah. And um, uh, he actually makes a speech in, in, in the House of Commons where he lists Brit pig bristles along with other things as, as why he has taken this daring and unexpected step to invite the Bolsheviks to London for talks. Now, the, the intelligence chiefs are really flabbergasted and so yeah. indeed are members of um his own government uh churchill in particular and curzon as well and um the, the, there are some famous quotes um churchill calling the bolsheviks the hairy baboon i believe and apparently also an incident when the russians come first for talks where curzon refuses to shake their hand and lloyd george says be a man um shake their hand i it's it's not cricket if you don't um but but really a very um and and, and another thing that's worth kind of uh just emphasizing is it, this is one of those moments of huge drama in british history because very very near in time lloyd george is doing exactly the same thing with the ira britain has been fighting the ira in ireland um allegedly fighting them to get a defeat um, and bring Ireland back within the community of the British Empire fully. And then suddenly Britain is in talks with the IRA and you have Michael Collins and Eamon de Valera in Downing Street walking on the same tarmac as uh, as the Russian, as the Bolsheviks would be. So, you know, two very similar um, policy approaches and, and very daring. Mm, yeah. So with the Soviet delegation, we had two very interesting kind of characters. Is it Victor Nogin and Nikolai... Kleshenko, is that how you pronounce his name? That's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting better at Russian, slowly. Yeah, I, I think you mean Klishko. Klishko, <laughs> okay. And um, and these 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 are quite interesting characters to be sent over as part of this sort of delegation because obviously Lloyd George is hoping, I think he's running under a philosophy of by getting Russia involved in trade is going to kind of make it less likely there'll be a conflict with Russia. And yet Russia do send these two quite controversial characters as part of their of their kind of negotiation team. So Victor was a seasoned, a seasoned Bolshevik, and um, Nikolai had been previously deported from the UK for his activities connected to the 1917 revolution. So it's not exactly the best start. And, and obviously, it's th their arrival worries the intelligence chiefs. Can you tell us a little bit about them and, and what kind of happened? It's just when you describe it like that, it is it is kind of remarkable, isn't it? And and I guess uh, in all my writing, I've overused the adjective audacious when it comes to um, the Russians. Mm. And I think this is a good example of their audacity, um, <laughs> quite impressive in a way. Um, yeah. So so basically, heading up the commit, heading up the delegation is a very respectable kind of a Bolshevik. Mm. Um, he did have. Um, blood on his hands directly because he had he had um, uh, robbed banks to get money for the Bolsheviks back in the 1910s. This is mm -hmm. Mikhail Krasi. But more importantly, he had run the Siemens power station in Petrograd, and mm -hmm. he was a serious um, electrical engineer and also understood about business. So he was the kind of person I think that Lloyd George would have been hoping the delegation would be made up of. Um, but instead, um, uh, a number of the members are kind of a bit rough around the edges. And, and Klishko in particular, I mean, Noggin is the one that the uh, special branch officers who were sent to Newcastle upon Tyne to watch the steamship arrive, he's the one mm. they're told to look out for. Mm. I think they're told to look out for someone with a ginger beard um, and they don't spot him. But um, I guess anyway, someone can always shave a beard off. And Klishko, well, he was sent because he spoke English. And he had worked in the Metropolitan Vickers Company in the 1910s in Britain, but he had specifically been expelled because he was a hostile revolutionary, a seditious force. I guess um, the, you know, the intelligence um, community uh, basically weekly are um, giving information to the prime minister saying it's not a good idea doing these talks. It, it's still not a good idea doing these talks. This is really dangerous. You know, 
Um, we don't know what was in the suitcases they brought in. We think they're selling, giving propaganda for free to enemies of the state internally. Um, also, we think they've brought in a variety of precious objects to try and raise money to fund the uh, creation of communist organizations in Britain. The delegation is present when the Communist Party of Great Britain is created, so that they're here at the same time. And people obviously feel, and incorrectly, that they had somehow helped to orchestrate that. So um, it it didn't look like it was going well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I think hopes for a deal um, uh, were not high, but Lloyd George was a very uh, tricksy and, um, and a tricksy person. And he was committed to his idea that this was all a bit of a bogeyman. And actually, once you saw well, what he says at one point is, you wait, when we sign a deal with them and start buying the pig bristles again and the coal and the iron ore, uh, they'll stop being Bolsheviks pretty quickly. Yeah, <laughs> that They'll be attracted by all the money that's coming in and, and, and they'll end up resembling the West and, and normal countries in inverted commas really quite quickly. <laughs> so, so by March of 1921, the treaty became a fact, and uh, and the hopes of removing the the uh, Bolsheviks regime by force had faded. But now this treaty presented a bit of a, a nightmare scenario for British intelligence. So, could you tell us a little bit about this sort of this so called nightmare scenario for them? I don't think anyone really realised when the on the day the treaty was signed exactly how it would be used to create a nightmare. So. Clearly, the Russian delegation had partly got up to no good while it was in London negotiating the treaty. Yeah. In fact, some of them had been sent home. Um, so they had that step had been taken against them. Um, clearly, it was expected, probably even by Lloyd George, that in it, as well as signing contracts and um, arranging import and export, there'd probably be some nefarious activity going on on the sidelines. But... What nobody expected, um, and indeed it wasn't, it was a loophole in the treaty effectively, because if anyone had thought of it, they would no doubt have um, taken steps in the document to prevent it happening, was that um, Britain sent a delegation to, to Moscow, about sort of 15 to 20 people, it varied over the years, and opened up um, offices in, in, in its trade delegation in, in uh, what would become Leningrad, I think in Vladivostok as well. So the kind of port cities where you would expect you'd, you'd need trading agents to deal with import and export. But we're talking sort of 30, 40 people maximum. Mm. Um, and I think they expected the same to come from the Soviet Union. Um, but actually, they ended up with three or 400 people um, coming from the Soviet Union, all to work in the uh, Russian trade delegation and in a company, a spin-off company they created in order to... Um, work under British law called Arcos Limited, the All Russian Cooperative Society, ARCOS. And so you have three or four hundred people by 1922, probably growing all the time. Um, uh, and they, um, a large number of them, more than half of them, I think, have diplomatic protection. So even though they're working in a British company, many of them, they're here formally as diplomats. They bring their families, some of them, and they live uh, in Hampstead and Golders Green um, in a kind of... Uh, Russian community. It's um, nicknamed a Russian colony, the Bolshevik com- colony at Hampstead by um, MI5 in one of its reports. Um, and um, so they have an awful lot of manpower to do an awful lot of stuff. And it, to intelligence chiefs looking in correctly, it doesn't really look like you would need that number of people for the scale of the trade that's going on. And of course, at the other end, the trade can be managed with 40 to 50 Brits in Russia. Yeah. Now you you've already slightly mentioned this, but um can you just tell us a little bit about those institutions that Russia set up and kind of what they were supposed to be doing? Yes. So the Russian trade delegation is really in lieu of an embassy. Mm. So one of the um tricks that Lloyd George had um pulled in signing the treaty was he had uh, signed a treaty which he said was it was safe because it didn't formally recognize the existence of Soviet Russia. So de jure it did not say that um, the Bolsheviks were the rightful rulers of Russia. 
and and that's what would have been necessary in order to create a full scale embassy. Uh, the Russians, the, the Bolsheviks, were not allowed access um, initially to the old embassy, which was in Belgravia. Um, so they had to get their own premises in in Moorgate uh, and a couple of other places. The Russian trade delegation therefore existed to kind of do what the treaty said you could do, um, but also for the normal diplomatic uh, things. That's where the foreign office would have gone if it needed to talk to someone. And then in order to put um, contracts through for pig bristles and coal and iron, it's useful, and this would be the same today, to have an entity that is uh, registered formally in Britain, so a limited company. So they create Arcos. Now, in reality, uh, you can see it in the staff lists that MI5 managed to get hold of at various points during the 20s. The, the, the dividing line between the Russian trade delegation and Arcos is, is pretty non-existent, and people move very porously between the two um, organizations. It's one entity. Um, uh, but it, it has these two different faces. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. So one of the one of the things that you found that featured quite heavily in the MI5 files at the time was um, Russian jewellery smuggling. Can you just tell us a bit about what you found about this and kind of what its significance is? Yeah, it's significant. I mean, I guess, first of all, it's significant because, you know, if you institute a communist utopian um paradise uh, and expropriate the wealth of the old ruling classes mm. one of the things you come into um, possession of is an awful lot of jewels an awful lot of jewels that were owned by the people you've either driven from the country or murdered or um, forcibly impoverished mm. there was also a lot of gold um, and precious metal which had been held by russian banks as security against loans and uh, all of this comes to the Bolsheviks. Now, it is interesting, I think, in, in Soviet historical terms, that their first thought was not to um, spend this on um, enriching the average lot of an ordinary Russian or Ukrainian. Um, instead, uh, what they did was, uh, over a number of years, they systematically smuggled it out of Russia and sold it, often usually on the black market, though there were yeah. some legitimate deals as well, and the money didn't flow back to Russia. It stayed in capitalist countries and was largely to fund communist propaganda in those countries. So we think when Klitschko arrived, he must have been dragging some very heavy bags because he brought platinum bars mm. in his suitcase, which were sold to fund um, the uh, communist movement in Britain. We also know the wonderful story, one of, one of the best days in the archives, we know of a, a man who was uh, in the Bloomsbury set called Francis Maynell, who was a communist sympathizer and traveled to Russia in the early 20s to see for himself what, what things were like there. And he had one of those what, one of those early kind of um, managed tours, which showed him all the good bits and, and, and implied that if anything wasn't good, it was um, because of the, the white Russians. Francis Maynell was given... Uh, a, a a set of diamonds to bring back um, to sell to keep a, a left wing newspaper in Britain um, going and stop it going out of business. The Daily Herald, which many many decades later would become the Sun, um, with a rather different political slant. But he brought them back, and in order not to get caught at customs, um, which would probably have been a problem anyway with so many diamonds, but certainly if he, they knew they were coming from Soviet Russia, um, mm. he sat one night. I think he was in Riga at the time, so he'd already left um, Soviet territory. But he sat one night with a box of um, soft-centered chocolates and pressed a diamond into the center of each chocolate. And then a few days after he got back to Britain, he and his wife ate their way through the chocolates, um, carefully removing diamond after diamond as they went. You wouldn't want to get that wrong. <laughs> no, and, and I think it, it's interesting. Some people have speculated, uh, some historians have speculated that... Um, a very large proportion of the work that was done in the Amsterdam diamond and, and fine gem market in the 20s was um, reliant on Russian pre-revolutionary jewels that were being recut so as to hide their provenance mm. so that um, the rightful owners who were probably in Paris or Prague or Berlin couldn't um, seize them um, and then sold on the black market. 
Mm, oh, fantastic. I found that really interesting because um, years and years and years ago, I, I did some research for a documentary that never happened um, about art theft. And um, I learned from um, the guy who was our sort of technical advisor that apparently the Soviet Union specialised in um, in art forgery. And, um, and it, apparently the different states were masters of different elements of the craft. And it was just really fascinating. So it kind of, it, I'm assuming when all the jewellery ran out, they had to kind of get more creative with fundraising (laughs) yeah yeah that's really interesting um there's a wonderful museum in um washington dc which is Mm. the house of marjorie merriweather post Mm. and she was the heiress to the post um serial fortune so they Mm. were the biggest Mm. competitors of kellogg's and she was married to a u.s diplomat in the 30s and she went around uh, moscow in the 30s buying up icons and um artworks very cheaply from people who were selling them to make ends meet yeah. and um they're all on display there and and there is some suspicion that perhaps not all of them are um very old the the paint may still have been wet on a few of them when she bought them Oh, brilliant. So it was estimated by, is it British intelligence efforts, that the British communists were getting funding from Russia in the region of something about £2 million. Is that, was that per year? Or? I think that I, I think that was over the first two years that the delegation was, was in. Yeah. Um, and then it does get less after that, because partly because Moscow doesn't think the Communist Party is doing very well in Britain, and so they, <laughs> they kind of punish it by... By, with, by reducing funds. <laughs> well, what was that? What was that money kind of used for then initially of the Communist Party of Great Britain? Officially, it was used to produce an awful lot of leaflets mm. to move people around the country um, for meetings, uh, to pay for workers' newspapers. So there was a weekly and a and a daily mm. um, newspaper, um, and a lot of it was poured. In. Neither of those was the Daily Herald, which was a mass market newspaper that was read by uh millions of workers every day in britain and 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 was sort of softer left but a lot of money from russia went into bankrolling that in the early 20s but one of the reasons the the bolsheviks decide to reduce the amount of money flowing into britain is that they um they have moles inside the communist party who are reporting back to them and at a certain point in time they determine that actually an awful lot of the money is just going to pay mates of mates of mates of communists um and um not large sums i don't think anyone retired on the money that they got mm. um it, as individuals but but really that it was it was a bit of a bun fight um or, or a gravy train yeah yeah and intelligence officials were growing more and more concerned with the communist party and, and its links to russia many of its senior leaders were placed under permanent surveillance can you tell us a little bit about some of the people who were so, sort of followed and and what was found about them yeah i think one in particular who who really um well a couple of a couple who are worth mentioning are andrew rothstein um and eva reckett mm. um uh because they didn't limit themselves only to to, to men and, and indeed there were a number of senior women in in the communist party of great britain but andrew rothstein was uh i guess um russian by origin his father theodore rothstein had been an important uh socialist uh thinker back in the 1900s and lenin had come and stayed with theodore rothstein and a very young andrew rothstein in islington when he was in london in in the 1900s rothstein was just finishing oxford at the time he was an undergraduate at balliol who got chucked out for being a communist effectively and um, he headed off to russia to see the new world and came back and was one of the founder members of the communist party of great britain and and he was followed he he was um he was a firebrand i guess would be the way that you would describe it mm. um these days he he was very good at um talking up the soviet union and giving rousing speeches he published an immense amount of um pamphlets which um defended the soviet point of view um and um yeah, he was followed ruthlessly and relentlessly. Probably a questionable effort because uh, what was very clear about him was that he was um, he was incredibly visible and a self-publicist. And so one sort of wonders how much secret activity he could really have got up to. But but MI5 uh, wasn't satisfied. Special Branch and MI5 weren't satisfied to kind of think that they were seeing all that he was up to. So, so they followed him. They intercepted all of his posts. There's a lovely... Um, there's a lovely exchange in the files between him and one of his brothers who was not a communist um, where um, the brother, we don't have Andrew's letter because obviously that was sent off to the brother. Um, but we have the reply, which says 
you know, I think you're a bit credulous. Um, I think this, I think the Bolsheviks are quite nasty, really, and I don't really think they're helping people in Russia. And I think you should wake up and and wise up a bit. Um, uh, so, so that was quite amusing. Um, Eva Reckitt um, was um, uh, another person, and and the files on her are enormous. Um, she was a very rich woman in her own right because um, she was the daughter of the owners of Reckitt's um, Chemicals Company, which was based in Hull, which today is still known as Reckitt Benkiser. So it's now a, a multinational firm, most recently in the news, telling people not to inject themselves with bleach <laughs> following events. And um, she she was very drawn to socialism and she gave a lot of money to the Communist Party of Great Britain. And she lived in uh, a flat in Lincoln Inn's Fields, in the centre of London, but in a very, very secluded spot. And MI5 identified that it was really impossible to get to or from Eva Reckitt's flat um, without being seen. And they determined that this meant that perhaps the flat was being used to store propaganda or to hatch plots. And that was indeed most likely the case. And so Eva Reckitt was followed around the country uh, when she went on walking holidays in the South Downs. She had a little cottage there. Um, MI5 people would come to the local pub, which was kind of just over the hill, and then every so often walk up and pop their head over the side of the hill. And a little bit later than the um, than the period covered in my book, we know from the correspondence that she bought herself a special radio aerial, which in the correspondence she says it's to in order so so that she can hear Radio Moscow, which may indeed have been the case, but. MI5 uh, determined that this might be for some secret communications and signaling with the Soviets, and and they were they were absolutely uh, obsessed with um, this aerial and where it had come from and um, what it was being used for. Mm. That sounds brilliant. I don't know why when you said MI5 comes to the pub, it just sounded quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I went to see. I I drove out of mm. London when I was researching the book just to see it's near arundel of the cottage mm. um a uh, very pretty little cottage and um uh and the pub i can't remember the name of it now but um it really um uh, you know you, you really felt like an mi5 person probably wearing a trilby hat or something would have stuck out a mile in this um bucolic setting um, but perhaps they were better at disguise than i'm giving them credit for <laughs> One would hope, but uh, so despite those, uh, the, some of the real threats that were faced, there were also many false leads, and there was all there was this atmosphere of paranoia within the intelligence services. But there was also a bit of misogyny because it was a very male-dominated environment. Um, and there's one episode that presents a good cautionary tale, and that's of the case of Claire Sheridan. Can you just tell us a little bit about about her story and, and what the files said about her? Yeah, so if you put Claire Sheridan and Andrew Rothstein together and look at just the volume of material that MI5 collected, I think it would be correct to conclude or begin to conclude that they were really um, rather distracted by self-publicists in the in the 20s. And, and that's probably something that uh, later uh, intelligence agencies kind of corrected in themselves, because Claire Sheridan mm. was also uh, um, an enormous um, self-publicist and sort of saw herself as a, a, a legend in her own um, lifetime. She was a sculptor and um, she had had to train herself to be a sculptor after her husband was killed early in the First World War. Um, and um, in 1920, she uh, meets through a mutual acquaintance, uh, Lev Kamenev, who was the first head of the Russian uh, negotiating delegation in London. And she has an affair with him. Mm. And MI5's following Lev Kam Kamenev everywhere he goes. So they obviously work out that um, uh, that, that they're having an affair. Um, they head off to um, head off to the Isle of Wight together. But um, for, for a combination of complicated reasons, they become very interested in Claire Sheridan and they also get the opportunity to track her much more closely than uh, one might have expected. Um, so they become very interested in it because she's a cousin of Winston Churchill. And um, they Churchill's in the government. He's, he's party to the negotiations that are going on. He's obviously very anti them. Um, but um, they get very frightened that Claire Sheridan might be passing on secrets to Kamenev that she's come by through the family. Um, uh, and indeed, they tip... Churchill off that he shouldn't be saying anything, and and they follow Sheridan very assiduously. Uh, Sheridan's friend Sidney Russell Cook um, 
owns a nice house on the Isle of Wight, and and it's him who suggests that Claire Sheridan and Lev Kamenev come down for the day on the train and see the beach and uh, write love poems to each other. Actually, we discover. Um, and um, Sidney Russell Cook has um, was a wartime member of MI5, and uh, so it's not accidental that he makes this suggestion, and he's actually kind of placed. Um, He's just left MI5 services formally and taken up a job as a stockbroker in 1920, but nonetheless, keeping very close ties. And he's asked to track um, Claire Sheridan and Kamenev. Now, it's probably already clear from the details I've given you, this this is a this is kind of one of those uh, lines of inquiry that you just couldn't let drop until it had burned itself out. Imagine the horror in MI5 when in the autumn of 1920, so height of the negotiations. Kamenev is is told to leave the country and not to come back because of the propaganda activity that's been going on. So he's one of the diplomats chucked out during the negotiating period. He invites Claire Sheridan to come with him to uh, Soviet Russia and to create busts of all of the leading Bolsheviks. So she sails off from Newcastle upon Tyne to Bergen and then overland to Russia in the autumn of 1920. And MI5 just doesn't know what to do yeah and 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 she stays there um for a few weeks and um uh meets i think hg wells and a number of other people hmm. who are also kind of trying to get in on on this new magical country that's being created and um she when she comes back sydney russell cook is round at her flat uh in a heartbeat and um he takes possession of her diary from her time in Soviet Russia and reads it and, and replays it um, to MI5. And it is a very interesting diary in its own right. Um, and really up to that point, as far as we can tell, they, they were very frightened that she was a dangerous um, agent, secret agent, and they didn't really know what instructions she might have come back with. But she was really nothing more than a self-publicist because her intention all along was to publish the diary in full which she did the next year. Um, it's a wonderful book called From Mayfair to Moscow, and it's um, it's freely available uh, um, online actually now because it's out of copyright uh, and well worth a read. Um, and interestingly, she writes in the diary, she alludes in the diary to the fact that um, uh, in Moscow, they knew Sidney Russell Cook had been a spy in MI5, and they knew that she was friends with him. And so at one point, she finds herself, as she thinks, in danger because of her friendship with Sidney Russell Cook. So the Bolsheviks are thinking she's a British spy, but the British are thinking yeah. she's a Soviet spy. Yeah. Um, some have speculated over the years, there hasn't been very much written on Claire Sheridan um, and her relationship with Russia, but some who have written about it have speculated that perhaps she was a British spy and that she was sent on MI5 instructions all along. But I think we can be pretty confident that's not the case because MI5 continues to hound her all over the world, including into the Tunisian desert um, in the late, in the mid twenties, um, checking who she's talking to, um, what she's up to and calling her a thoroughly dangerous person. So she never really got off their radar, not until 19. I think 1946 is the last entry in the file. So yeah, and and really, she had no interest in politics whatsoever, you know. And she she um, her sculptures of um, the leading Bolsheviks are the first ones ever to be made, and uh, and the pictures in from Mayfair to Moscow of them they're, they're really quite good. Mm. I should check that out. There was also a growing fear of illegal spies being sent to England to gather intelligence and stoke um, sort of seeds of discontent. There's two cases that sort of stood out to me. There's one of George Brown um, and there's one of Johnny Walker and that one left the sort of deepest scars. Can you tell us a little bit about those cases? The Johnny Walker case is, is fantastic because Johnny Walker is a, well, it's a code name mm. um, and um, it's clearly based on the whiskey bottle and um, probably not a very good code name. You know, he probably probably hadn't been taught that at, at um, spy school in Moscow. Um, <laughs> but but um, his real name was, he was a man called Jacob Kirkenstein and um, he'd grown up in Latvia. He was, I think, in his in his mid to late thirties by the time we're talking about when he comes to Britain. Hmm. He'd grown up in, in Latvia under the Russian empire, um, found himself caught up in the 1905 revolution when he was a, a kind of an apprentice um, telegraph expert in Riga and sent into exile in Siberia. Um, he manages to escape from exile in Siberia and make his way to 
the USA via Britain, where he ends up working on the railways and learning English and speaking good, fluent English. So suddenly he's he's potentially valuable um, mm. once the Bolsheviks come to power as someone you can send abroad. He and his wife, Vali, who comes from a similar background, in 1917, they travel overland across uh, the USA to San Francisco and then overland across Russia um, to get back to uh, the revolution. Mm. They're very excited by it, always been socialists. And then after the First World War has ended and, and Russia signed the peace treaty with uh, the Germans, um, he ends up working on the railways in Russia because that's his area of expertise. He has a terrible falling out with Trotsky, um, who's in charge of the railways at that point. Um, and he fears for his life because obviously it, it, uh, it, at that time it, and subsequently Soviet um, uh, bureaucratic culture, the punishment for failure or getting on the wrong side of someone can be swift and absolute. Um, so as he describes it himself many, many years later, um, he had to do some quick thinking and he suddenly proposes at the uh, World Congress of the Comintern that he thinks he could make his way abroad secretly and help the Russians out in Britain or in Western Europe in a variety of ways. And um, they agree. And oddly enough, they agree to let him go with his wife because that was quite a privileged position to be in. Often when, even in the 20s, when diplomats were sent away, uh, wives and families were kept back, which was a way of preventing them from defecting. Yeah. Um, but he, he and Valley, his wife, head up to Murmansk uh, in the Arctic Circle and take a little fishing boat across to Norway, uh, obviously a very isolated spot. A number of other communists are doing the same to try and avoid, um, uh, these are French communists actually, in the next boat beside them, going back from the Comintern Congress and trying to avoid being spotted by French police or French agents. Uh, the waters are choppy, the, the boat with the French in it uh, capsizes and they all die but Jacob and Valley managed to make it to Norway travel down the length of Norway in secret and then go across to Newcastle upon Tyne again interesting dimension to this was the importance of Newcastle as a port for passengers coming from the Baltic in those days I had no idea about that until I did the book and he makes it and kind of radios back to Russia for instructions and, and they basically say we need you to operate an agent network to get propaganda through to Scotland and the north of England and help the workers to, to rise up against their masters. And he spends the next um, year and a half doing that very successfully. Nobody knows he's arrived. He's, he's an illegal. And then suddenly, 1923, he gets wind that he thinks his um, cover has been blown, which was most likely true. And he leaves with his wife under an assumed identity, which he man he manages to get an illegal passport with the help of a um, sympathetic socialist clergyman from Scotland who signs the necessary documents, goes back to New York briefly, um, and um, then re-enters the country under his own identity, no longer Johnny Walker, which he had been when he was in the north of England, and takes up a fully-fledged job as a, as a trading delegate in Arcos in London. And even then, MI5 doesn't spot that this person has been in Britain illegally before, that he has this back history as an agent. It only really comes to comes to knowledge through a variety of leaks um, in 1925, 1926. And when he's operating openly, if you like, in London, he lives in Richmond in a very nice house. He has an agent network too in the south of England, um, and it may have been involved, we think, in stealing plans and designs for military equipment and hardware that were being made in British factories at the time. So I guess since we all know that the Communist Party of Great Britain did not foment a revolution, his um, early years of activity in the north of England and Scotland were something not to worry about too much, probably, but they weren't to know that at the time necessarily. But certainly the theft of um, military plans would worry any state, and um, they did seem to have quite some success at that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In 1924, Britain elected its first ever Labour Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald. And when he assumed office, he started to receive the secret intelligence reports created by Special Branch. And he was a bit shocked by what he saw. Um, can you just tell us about what he sort of found questionable about these reports? So um, the, the intelligence agencies felt that Lloyd George's government obviously hadn't made the right decisions on Russia. But nonetheless, they'd, they'd found themselves in a fundamentally benign 
relationship with mm. government ministers. And then there was a conservative administration in, in 1922, 1923. Um, and um, these reports were consumed avidly by some cabinet ministers like Churchill, who had continued to receive them and and broadly welcomed and believed mm. by, by um, prime ministers. Ramsay MacDonald comes in and... Um, there's great fear about what he's likely to bring with him as he comes into power with the Labour administration among the intelligence community, mm. even before his first day in office. And and then at the end of, uh, during the first month that he's in power, he gets the first of these National Intelligence Directorate reports. And he says, um, I'm quite surprised. Uh, there's not much in here that you couldn't learn by reading the Daily Herald or um, just talking to some communists in the street. There's nothing really here that seems to me very secret. Mm. And he also says, really, he's the first person that we know of to make this point to the intelligence chiefs. Britain has an emerging issue with fascism. At that point, obviously, fascism in power in Italy uh, and a minority movement across the continent, including in Britain. And he says, you you don't seem to mention at all these um, these fascist activists who beat up left-wing workers and, and have a number of noxious views. I'd like you to do more work on that. And um in the meantime, I'm not sure how valuable these reports really are. Along with a whole host of other things, mm. this really sends paranoia levels inside the intelligence community and indeed with their friends in the Conservative Party through the ceiling. Mm. And um, it becomes their kind of mission over the next few months to try and make the minority Labour government last as short a time as possible. Yeah, and they don't last very long, do they? <laughs> they don't last very long, and, and they actually end up falling out of office over the head of Russia mm. because MacDonald had stood on a manifesto which said that the arrangements Lloyd George had put in place fundamentally good, but they needed to be strengthened, and uh, Britain needed to recognise that the Soviet Union was the country... Um, uh, that the Russian government, the Tsarist government wasn't coming back and there wasn't going to be a democratic government, so they needed to give formal recognition. He starts a process of trying to do that. Uh, the talks uh, generate some treaties that make the House of Commons very angry, and because he doesn't have a majority, he's not able to win those votes. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of other kind of semi-juicy scandals, which the intelligence community worked quite hard to, along with uh, organisations like the Daily Mail and the Conservative Party, to... Uh, give a kind of whiff of sulfur to and um, make it seem like maybe Ramsay MacDonald was um, presiding over a nest of spies who mm. were doing the Soviet Union's business, which was not the case. No. So in 1926, British intelligence kind of greatest fear came to fruition. There was a call for a general strike and a general strike was considered to be the first step in a, a violent revolution against the government as it had been in 1917 Russia. Can you talk to us about kind of what happened in that time and, and what happened sort of after all that as well? For an intelligence community, a general strike, um, I think this is true in other places where they've happened, mm. a general strike is a bit like the equivalent of a pandemic for the NHS. Mm. Um, so you get the general strike in 1926. It had actually been threatened the year before, and uh, Stanley Baldwin, the Conservative Prime Minister, had quite cleverly managed to pacify the workforce um, in the mines, in particular in the coal mines. They'd mm. gone back to work on a kind of temporary deal that was uh, timed to run out in the spring of 1926, and they were going to revert back to bad terms and conditions. But he used that time, and his government used that time to prepare um, stockpile, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in order to uh, defeat a general strike if it occurred. When it looked likely that there was to be a general strike, massive numbers of retired First World War intelligence chiefs, special branch officers, were drafted back in, called back to the front line to save Britain as they saw it, and um, the stockpiles were called into action as well. Mm. Rather less pleasantly, the Home Secretary at the time, who was a um, very, very right-wing member of the Conservative Party, had also kind of done a side deal with some um, right-wing, uh, I guess, um, what would you call them, clubs and political groups that were not aligned to the Conservative Party, some of which were aligned to fascist groups, to add some extra muscle, should it be needed, um, to mm. defeat the workers. And um, as many of your listeners will know, of course, the general strike lasted for um, almost a couple of weeks and then it collapsed and the the, um, the unions were crushingly defeated. The terms and conditions didn't improve for the miners and uh, quite punitive new legislation that the, the, 
the Trades Disputes Act was put through Parliament to prevent um, or make much harder the kind of sympathetic strikes that had uh, made a general strike possible. What's What's interesting and not generally reflected in the kind of main uh, above ground story is that um, it's widely believed in conservative circles and, uh, and specifically in the mind of the Home Secretary, William Johnson Hicks, that Russia stood fully behind the, gen- the decision to have a general strike, attempts to keep the strike going longer, the supply of money to the strikers. And there was some money that came from Russia to support the miners. But, but really, it was a homegrown general strike. It was caused by British domestic issues. And it was the Trade Union Congress that took the decision, not under influence from Moscow. But it is widely believed in conservative circles. And crucially, it becomes the view of Stanley Borden as well, who had been quite moderate and not particularly obsessed with um, the Soviet Union. Um, It becomes his view that the Russians had somehow been involved as well. And William Joynson Hicks, the Home Secretary, stokes that right through 1926, the winter of 1906 into 1927. And Joynson Hicks becomes determined to get the Russians out. And he has basically put um, intelligence chiefs on notice that he wants to have any misdemeanor or error um, that they spot brought to his attention so that... um, he can use it as leverage to try and get the Russians out. And this is what leads to the raid against the Arcos offices, isn't it? That's right. Yes. So 1927 in May, one day, Joynton Hicks is in the House of Commons and um, Sir Vernon Kell uh, comes to see him and says, um, we found something you might be interested in, Home Secretary. Basically, a British member of the workforce of Arcos so they did have some British employees, mainly in kind of uh, sort of fairly menial, basic kind of roles. Uh, a British member of the workforce who works in the photostat department, which we would call the photocopying department these days, um, was asked back in January to photocopy a British military training manual, which they weren't supposed to have in the building because it has stamped on the front of it that it's protected under the Official Secrets Act. And he's given us a copy of this because he wasn't happy about it and he's just been sacked. And um, what do you want us to do about it? And as is recorded in typescript in the documents, uh, he says, raid Arcos, raid it. And then he says, do you want it in writing? And we don't know the answer to that question, actually. But (laughs) (laughs) they went off and um, did the necessary to get warrants to search Arcos. From Arcos was its headquarters were in Moorgate in the city of London. So they had to go to a magistrate in the city of London. And they marshal a force of about 200 police officers. And in May, one day, they they burst through the doors at about four o'clock in the afternoon. And they line everybody up who works at Arcos. Uh, they search them and they pull the building to bits. They lift all the carpets. They pull the wood paneling off the walls. They unscrew the telephones. Um, they eventually, the raid lasts for two, three days. They use oxyacetylene torches to burn through the safe doors in the basement to see what is in the safes in the bottom of Arcos. And the assumption is um, William Joynson Hicks doesn't wait to get the results of the search. The assumption is, and he gives quotes to this effect to the Daily Mail while the research is going on, that they're going to find a hell of a lot of really incriminating stuff and something big is going to have to be done about this um, rogue, this renegade organisation at the heart of the British Empire. Yeah. And this this raid would actually have a devastating effect on British counterintelligence for years to come. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So the raid from William Joynson Hicks, perspective the raid achieved exactly what he wanted it to achieve stanley Mm. Baldwin probably wasn't very happy that it had happened because even though he was persuaded the russians were up to no good he would have been content for things to tick along and kind of try and bring them back back into line without sparking some major international incident and this was indeed treated as a major international incident Uh, and we know from soviet documents that um, ordinary soviet people taking their lead from the state thought that Britain was about to invade. They thought that this was this was an act of war. Joint and Hicks was happy because the Soviets all traipsed off. They were forced to leave. Um, Stanley Baldwin expelled them all and their families, and, and they all had to leave by early July 1927. It was a bit of a PR disaster, however, mm. because unless you were really of the mindset of Joint and Hicks, um, what you saw was that um, the British police had invaded diplomatic premises, which they weren't supposed to do because that was effectively sovereign Soviet soil. They hadn't really given that any thought. And and that's where the distinction between the Russian trade delegation and Arcos becomes important because it, it was to turn out that the entirety of the floor space of the officers was both 
at the same time, Arcos, which was a, a, a British company, so you could raid that if you had a warrant, and also the Russian trade delegation, which you just couldn't raid under the Vienna Convention. So a bit of a PR disaster. There's a couple of other not particularly felicitous moments in the story. So we, we learn probably that male police officers frisked female Arcos workers to check what they were carrying, which um, even today would be problematic, but in, 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 a, in, a, in an age of... Um, uh, in a what would you say in, in an age of different morality that was seen as particularly shocking in some quarters. So those are kind of the immediate consequences. In order to get the uh, right amount of evidence to expel the Russians, mm. uh, it's the view of Stanley Baldwin and his foreign secretary Austin Chamberlain that what's come out of the building isn't nearly good enough. So they find some leaflets that are propagandistic. Mm. They even find a few weapons, but it turns out the weapons are actually. Um, uh, samples of um, large orders that might have been placed with British factories to sell hunting rifles to Russia. Obviously, that's not going to happen after the raid. So Austin Chamberlain takes the decision to declassify um, signals intelligence that has come through the Government Code and Cipher School and MI6, which is much more incriminating and damning and does show that the Russians have been plotting mm. um, uh, in a variety of places around the world um, to act against British interests secretly. So I guess Britain ends up managing to save face in the immediate aftermath of the raid. And of course, Johnson Hicks has got what he wants. The Russians mm. have all gone. But what Britain has revealed to the Soviet Union is that it is able to read its signals tra traffic. And so from... Literally, I think the day after the announcement in the House of Commons and the publication of the dossier of evidence against the Russians, they changed their entire approach to cryptography. And Britain is no longer able to read the signals intelligence for at least a decade. So it was really a, a huge own goal. And, um, you know, there are, incident, there are instances, and I'm sure you know of more than I do, there are instances where these sorts of things happen and intelligence chiefs are very against the publication of evidence because they can see that this will damage their ability to work productively in future. This is not one of those cases. Um, mm. The intelligence chiefs at the moment that the evidence was decrypted, they were full square behind it because all they could think of was getting rid of the Soviets out of Britain. Mm, we won't think about the longer game. No. Well, look, Timothy, thank you so much for all this. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we sort of wrap up? And have you had any sort of final thoughts on, on what you kind of felt about all this, especially in the modern context? One of the things I was struck by was even in a completely analog age, when everything that you wanted to commit to memory as an organization had to be typed up or written down mm -hmm. and kept on paper in files. The volume of material that the intelligence agencies could gain access to by intercepting letters or telephone calls and then writing reports about them was impossibly large, especially for organizations that were um, forced to have rather low numbers of workforce. Mm. And I guess I was struck by how often I was reading things in the files and reading them in great detail because I was writing a book about it. And I was wondering, you know, how able were the workers of the day to give this proper weight? How able were they to put their hand to it if they needed to go back and check something? Um, which of these many people who were being followed did they actually properly read into and, and understand? And I think it must have been an impossible job um, and looking for a needle in a haystack. And, and of course, in our own digital age, and even with the help of search, the the, the, the amount of information that um, intelligence agencies can gain access to is infinitely increased. And one just wonders, how do you turn information into intelligence in that context? Mm, yeah, thank you very much. Well, look, where can, um, where can listeners find out more about you and your work? Uh, well, I, I tweet as... Tim Phillips, and I am currently working on a book about the Iron Curtain, which I traveled along last year from Norway to Azerbaijan. And I also have an Instagram account where I post pictures from time to time of my travels, which includes quite a lot with an intelligence bent, oh, cool. often pictures of the surviving bits of the Berlin Wall and things like that. And that's called Curtain and Wall. So just all one word, curtain and wall. I must check that out because I haven't seen that yet. I, I love Instagram. So. <laughs> ah, great. Look forward to checking that out. Well, well, Timothy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I've really enjoyed that. I've really enjoyed it too. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. 
minutes remaining on your monthly allowance. Hello? Hi, Dawn, it's Amy. Amy? Third year hockey team. I thought I'd say hi. Uh, I haven't got long. Me neither. Just a few spare minutes. Like getting your money's worth? Enjoy the delicious mayo chicken. Just 99p from the McDonald's saver menu. <laughs> from 11am, price and participation may vary.